Hey there, cats and goodies. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, coming at you live talking about episode 12 of season one of Star Trek Discovery entitled Vaulting Ambition. And uh, <laughs> this, this was an interesting episode, uh, an interesting experience watching this one. Um, for the first time, I think, in the history of my doing these video discussions, reviews, uh, you know, reactions to episodes, <sighs> I decided not to come on immediately thereafter, um, you know, after watching it the first time. I decided to let it sit a little bit, and uh, I actually waited till my sister and I could get together and watch it again. Like, it was the second time for myself, it was the first time for her. Um, because I really wanted to put into practice my, my own speculation, uh, you know, my own experience with a lot of Discovery's episodes, like, especially the ones that... I didn't really enjoy the first time through and I, I've come on subsequently and like sort of had many rants about and things had a lot of issues with uh, things I didn't like upon subsequent viewings of those episodes. I actually enjoyed them that much more um, when I kind of had an idea of what was coming and, and things like that uh, things that I didn't necessarily care for when I already knew they would be there in place, I had lesser of an issue with them and, and such like that. So I kind of wanted to put this hypothesis into practice that if if I watch this episode again, I would enjoy it that much more than the first time through. <laughs> because um, my first experience watching this episode was a little bit all over the place. Uh, it was dissatisfying to me to certain degrees. It was definitely not as good as the last two episodes, the previous two episodes. Our first episode being debuted to the Mirror Universe uh, when the show came back and then the episode following on from there. Of course, this episode as well follows suit with that sort of, uh, you know, themography in, in this particular season of being in the Mirror Universe, uh, of dealing with Mirror Universe quotients, equivalents from uh, some of our cast of characters and everything like that. Um, but this, this episode, the first viewing of this episode felt very schizophrenic, felt very all over the place. And I was kind of just watching it mystified and never quite gaining the level of, of satisfaction and excitement that I had the previous two episodes. Um, and I don't know exactly why that is. I mean, this, this episode just sort of felt really wonky and like it had to do, it had to, you know, pay service to a lot of different things that were happening at once. We kept flipping back and forth from discovery to Shenzhou to, you know, the, the sort of empire ship that, you know, Empress uh, or Emperor Giorgio is in command of the palace ship, uh, Caron, and everything like that. It just, it was flipping all over the place. And there were a couple of episodes early on into the season where, where it felt that way to me as well. Um, and it was a little bit disparaging. I just, it, you know, it was off putting off setting to me. And, uh, so here it was again. And the first experience watching this episode, I was just kind of like, oh my God, take a breath before we flip somebody somewhere else, you know, to something else, to somebody else. Um, because it was constant momentum, it was constantly moving, and there was so much going on. Um, balancing between Stamets and, and his doppelganger within the Mycelium Network, to Lorca in the Agony Booth, to Burnham uh, going up against Giorgio, and, and the posturing there, and, and you know, uh, calling back on Discovery with Saru and, and Laurel, and it was just going nuts. <laughs> It was just going nuts. Um, now, when we get the reveal that everyone saw coming, you know, revolving around Lorca and his origins and everything like that, I mean, everybody and, and their uncle and their brother was, was calling this from miles away, all the way back to the series start. Um, it was a highly, you know, speculated and touted speculation. Um, so I would say be wary of anyone who comes on subsequent to this episode's airing. And, and tries to, like, claim, oh, I called it, I'm the one, I told you, I told you what it was going to be, because everyone was telling you. Well, people were speculating from right out of the gate that that was going to be the case, and it proved true. Similarly to how Ash Tyler proved to be Volk, in, in a manner of speaking, and arguably in this episode, it was, it was the way they explained it was somewhat different to uh, my own interpretation and some other people's interpretations of it. Um, but it made it that much more interesting that it wasn't quite what we thought and expected necessarily. Um, but with Lorca, no, it's, it's brass tacks. That's exactly what it was all along. He is from the mirror universe 
And so be wary of anyone who comes on and is like, man, we called it, you know, I told you, I told you guys, you know, none of you believed me, you, I, you know, go back to this video because that's where I called it. Dude, everybody has been calling this since day one. <laughs> Everyone has been suggesting it and speculating toward this since day one. And that's another reason why I was a little dissatisfied because I, I have had discussions about this in comment threads and things like that. Um, I'm a little disappointed that Lorca proved to be so easily, you know, fitted into a particular hole. He was a peg that, you know, round peg that fit into a, a, a hole that was fitted perfectly for him. Um, and similarly with the, with the Volk thing, but like I say, with, with Ash Tyler Volk, they're doing it a little bit differently to how everyone expected it to be done. So there is leeway, there is still creativity there. Um, but there is so much of this show that it's kind of like, I, you know, I was sitting there watching it through the first viewing of this episode going, is there nothing that can happen that hasn't been predicted? <laughs> is, there, is there nothing we haven't already seen coming miles and miles and miles away? I saw a video subsequent to this on the Star Trek YouTube channel saying, oh, you know, uh, how did they keep that secret of Ash Tyler and all that stuff for so long? It wasn't a secret. Everybody knew it. <laughs> you know, what is creative is what is happening now where it's not quite what we thought it was necessarily. It, it still is. The end game is still the same, but how it how it was brought to that is different than we all expected, um, or at least most of us expected. You know, it, like for for my part, I have been saying that oh, it was uh, you know, Volk the Klingon was operated on, and and they you know crunched up his bones internally, and and you know implanted sort of a faux identity, a Manchurian candidate you know identity of Ash Tyler in him, and he's really Klingon born and bred but it seems to be the reverse in fact that they they put the mentality the psyche of Volk on top of Ash Tyler so Ash Tyler is actually a living breathing former Starfleet well you know current Starfleet turned Klingon mentally and I don't know other than torture why they did all those things to his body unless to confuse we the viewer um, because it seemed to make sense to me that they operated on his body, they, they shortened his bones, his spine, and all that stuff because he was originally Klingon, and they transfixed, you know, or transposed uh, Ash Tyler's DNA and blood and everything into him to make him human, to transform him into a human. Um, but apparently he has been human all along, and he just had the Klingon psyche implanted into his brain via engrams and all of that. So whatever. <laughs> you know, um, but the but the result is still the same. And and similarly with Lorca, we've all been speculating and thinking he's probably from the mirror universe all along, and now it proves to be true. So they can't really boast about having these secrets, the these you know clever reveals when it's something you know when these are things people have been saying from day one. Uh, so I was dissatisfied with that. I was a little upset with that, and. Um, you know, I mean, like I say, I had a better experience watching the episode because then I, I was more formatted mentally to what we would be going through. All the flip-flopping and flying from, you know, different perspectives to different characters to different things that were going on. Um, but the first time through, I was just kind of like, what? What? Oh, my God, what is going on? <laughs> you know, um, it was it was schizophrenic at best. The editing and the, and the flipping back and forth was schizophrenic at best. And uh, never giving us a moment to breathe easy, kind of, um, at least for my part. And there were a couple of things. I wrote down some notes here that I'm going to be referencing while I'm discussing this. Um, because there were a couple of things that kind of logistically don't add up to me. And it kind of picks up with where we ended the previous episode with uh, Empress or Emperor Giorgio firing on the rebel encampment where the Shenzhou and Michael Burnham and everything, they were in orbit of this planet. They were trying to let them escape. And so this barrage of photon torpedoes or whatever it was seemingly takes out, wipes out the entire rebel encampment before they can escape. And we're told, you know, oh, there, there seems to be like a ship coming in or something like that. We never see a ship coming in. To, to orbit or coming within range or anything. They never they never show us what's outside the ship. So this bombardment happens, and then we end with the debut of Empress... I keep wanting to say Empress. Emperor Giorgio. 
And that's where we end. That's the cliffhanger ending kind of sort of. So then we pick up this episode. Where's the planet? Where has the Shenzhou gotten off to? Like, they're not near the planet seemingly anymore. Um, when the shuttle is leaving the bay, I thought it was an interesting shot that they did, like showing, you know, a close up of, of the side of the shuttle and it leaves the bay. And then we see Discovery behind, or rather, Shenzhou behind it. And that was interesting. Um, but no planet. And they have to go however many light years away to the Empress's, the Emperor's, uh, you know, big ship and everything like that, which was really intriguingly designed. I don't know what's going on with that, with that particular vessel. Um, but so, like, how is it so far away? But just at the end of the previous episode, it was close enough in range to bombard the planet. It couldn't be detected, but we start this episode and it's somewhere else completely. But Giorgio was saying she she took up, you know, the reins for where Burnham was too hesitant to fire on the rebels. I'm not making sense of this. <laughs> you know, this is what I have in my notes. Um, did did Shinjo leave the planet side? Leave, you know, I forget the name of the planet, but the, the rebels planet? Did they leave it? Is there like a time skip? Um... Because we never see any other ships, really. And, I mean, it just seems like some time passed between the previous episodes. It could have been a lot of time. But so we're, if, you know, I would think the Shenzhou would have still been in orbit of that planet, but it wasn't. The planet was not seen at the opening of the episode, um, unless it was just off screen. But if, you know, the Quran had come into range to fire on the Rebels, why wasn't it there? Why did... Burnham and Lorca have to go somewhere else. I have, you know, where was the Quran in my notes? How did how did it fire on the rebels? Hidden coordinates, you know, conventional coordinates, some from you know some far stretch away. That Burnham and Lorca they have to take a shuttle to go to. I'm missing something. I must be <laughs> because it doesn't make sense. Um, there's a lot of you know muddled stuff there. Poor writing or whatever you want to, you know, chalk it up to being. Um, again, these are logistics. The overall impact of the story is not, you know, any more or less affected by this. It's just logistically, I'm like, okay, well, how did we start off this episode and the Shenzhou, the mirror Shenzhou is nowhere near the planet seemingly. We don't see the planet at all. And then they got to hop in a shuttle and they got to go find the Quran, the Emperor's you know, super crazy, ginormous, seems to be, you know, powered by its own little star or whatever it is, um, you know, giant space vehicle. It's somewhere else when at the end of the last episode, it apparently came in close enough range to bombard the planet. So what happened? Did, did it come in fire? And after, you know, Emperor Giorgio made her little statement to Michael Burnham. They went back to where they were, and they're like, now come, you come. Now you follow us. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm just completely missing the mark here, but this really confused me. And uh, it's the first time where it really stood out to me, like, you know, the, the inconsistencies and the, the discontinuity, for lack of a better term. It didn't make sense, and it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And I think that's why I largely... <laughs> had such a dissatisfying time watching it the first time through. You know, ignoring that, eschewing that, the second viewing, um, I was more capable of focusing on the story. I had more of an idea of the flipping and flopping around, how that was going to go, and I had a better time with it for that. Um, I did think it was pretty interesting, um, the whole Stamets versus Stamets thing. I, I liked that, you know, Hugh Culber, his, his, you know, partner was involved. I liked the way in which he was involved. Uh, you know, he's kind of passed on to the ethereal plane. The mycelium network is, is comparable to that. Um, I'm a little not sure, hesitant, apprehensive about the whole idea of you know, now the stakes are the, the, the universe, you know, like a typical Star Trek film. Now the stakes are the universe. The mycelium network has been infected by mirror stamets and it's all breaking down and all of our lives are in, you know, in jeopardy at risk. 
I'm not, I don't know how I quite feel about that. Um, I said in my notes, Dr. Hugh to the rescue, because uh, he is the one who, through love and compassion, talks sense to Stamets and wakes effectively wakes both of them back up again, which is somewhat interesting. Um, the whole aspect of, of Tyler being sort of, you know, brought back to his, him, his former persona, his former identity, seemingly, you know, uh, the way Saru sort of plays chess with Laurel and, and plays on her guilt and makes her save him, air quotes, and her... her screech to the heavens seems to signify you know like like we've seen with klingons before when a klingon dies they scream to let stovokor the klingon afterlife know a warrior is coming or something along those lines and that seemed to be what that signified she screamed because Voke was now truly dead seemingly um <laughs> i don't i don't know uh, the whole Lorca is from the Mirror Universe. Originally, again, I was kind of dissatisfied with that. I really like the character character of Lorca, and it just seems like it was too easy. It's just too easy for that to have been the case all along. Um, it is a little disappointing, but at the same time, arguably this, this you know, suggests that Prime Lorca was actually heroic. He probably actually went down with his ship. And then this Lorca swung in and took over. But I'm wondering if they're going to answer how he managed to get over into the Prime Universe. Um, and if that might not have something to do with how Discovery is going to swap back with Mirror Discovery, which is stuck in the Prime. It's also interesting that, um, you know, Mirror Stamets is actually on board the Quran, not the Mirror Discovery. He's doing the whole mycelial, you know, network studies and all that stuff on board the Quran. In, in a laboratory, so that's interesting. Um, and then another aspect I have in my notes, the last aspect I have in my notes as far as uh, sort of a minor gripe is everybody just starts working together. <laughs> like, the way Burnham so easily flips the switch, I mean, I know she's, she's doing it out of defense, trying to preserve her life. You know, Emperor Giorgio is about to murder her. All of that stuff that was revealed about, you know, she was the adopted mother of... Burnham and how they pick, you know, the Saru species, and it turns out to be that's their meal, which was freaking disgusting. <laughs> you know? My sister, when she was watching it with me, I didn't say anything. I just said, pay attention to what they say during that meal. And when that is revealed, she kind of did like a wide eyed, like, <laughs> look at me. Like, does that mean what I think it means? Yes, it does, unfortunately. Um, but all of that, you know, the, the ties between Mira Burnham and Mira Lorca apparently having some kind of romance, uh, a, a power struggle where they were vying to, you know, take down Giorgio and, and take over her, you know, uh, monarchy or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> like, it just seemed like Burnham started, she was really quick to, to try to work with Giorgio, and, um, which I guess makes sense because of, of the tie she has to, the, you know, the prime Giorgio. And how maternally sort of like a guardian, a guide she was. And, you know, Burnham, out of having to preserve her own life, she's giving up this information, you know, the spore drive and everything like that. Um, and then she is, you know, through what Giorgio is telling her, she formulates what we've all known and suspected all along, that Lorca is, in fact, from the universe. So all of that... It was just, it was it was interesting, but it, I feel like it was handled a bit more wonky than we have seen thus far. Um, I don't know if I can quantify it any better than that. I just, I watched this episode, and I, it starts off with these logistical discrepancies, these, you know, discontinuities that are, are kind of very, for the first time in my history watching this show, stand out so much, so glaringly, it was problematic, and then all everything else, you know, I had to watch it. I had to watch it a whole second time, <laughs> knowing and expecting all of that stuff was coming to really, really enjoy it, I guess is what I'm getting at. And so, I don't know what else I can really say. Um, not the best episode. A lot of th stuff happened in it. It was mostly interesting stuff. Um, but it just, it kind of feels like a bridge to the next big penultimate thing that's going to happen. 
And based on the preview for the next episode, Lorca steps up his game. He, he takes his role of dominance. And there's going to be an actual legitimate seeming power struggle between he and Giorgio. And, and Burnham's caught in the middle of that. And uh, I like seeing Saru step up his game. And, you know, Discovery is ours. It's no longer Lorca's and all this stuff. So it's interesting, like, how everybody is maneuvering around and how everyone seems to be becoming aware of everything. It just seems like all of this stuff is passing by so quickly and a little bit more easily than it probably should. Um, but what can you do? Uh, after the last two episodes, which really had me bouncing off the walls, this one fell somewhat flat. Even upon the second viewing, where it was much more enjoyable to watch, I still had these issues with it. And, uh... But, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, I, I can't come on and just, you know, pretend to have thoroughly enjoyed it from beginning to end if that's not how I really felt about it. And so I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below what you thought of episode 12 of Star Trek Discovery. i got to refer to my notes for the episode title, Vaulting Ambition, which is actually a line spoken by Giorgio in the episode referring to Lorca. And as soon as I heard that, if you've ever watched uh, the YouTube channel Cinema Sins, as soon as she speaks that dialogue, as the guy, uh, Jeremy, who, who narrates Cinema Sins, would usually say, um, you know, I was like, okay, roll credits. <laughs> <laughs> we're done that's the title of the episode and she said it um but yeah again i'd love to hear from you guys our povs can certainly disagree maybe you loved this episode every dripping minute of it where i just felt the faults stood out much much more and uh that's fine you know it's all subjective and i just love having that conversation and otherwise that'll be pretty much it for me on this hope this video finds you well live long and prosper at least until the next one <laughs> and i'll catch you later peace